James Fadiman, author of The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, Safe, Therapeutic, and Sacred Journeys. He's been involved with psychedelic research since the 60s, and he has taught in several universities, run profit and non-profit companies, written books, made films, lots of good things. And he's currently finishing a novel set in 12th century France. Please welcome James Fadiman. Well, you know, I kind of looked at it and thought, everybody else is getting to sit down. <laughs> and also, if you, you know, if you don't use PowerPoint, so you just have to listen, you know, again, it is a, it's a different mentality. And um, I, I like PowerPoints too, because then you don't have to listen. <laughs> and then afterwards, you go up and you say, can you send me the PowerPoints? Which is to say, I didn't listen. <laughs> or you put off so many PowerPoints, there was no possible way to take notes. So here we are. Anyway, fantastically good conference. I mean, I get invited now to the kind of the major conferences, and I. I'm really tired of listening to all my friends talk about their already published research. So this is this is kind of this really is what the cutting edge is about, and also that this has been so heavily ayahuasca. This is the Northern California cutting edge. Because <laughs> when I go around the country talking to different groups at this point, often I'll do a little bit of research, which I saved you from today. Uh, but it's kind of what drugs have you had? What drugs are you using? What drugs do you like? And ayahuasca is actually relatively rare the farther away you get from the Bay Area. <laughs> right. So Peru, Bay, you know, it's a couple of little, you know, if you were looking from outer space and all the people who are taking ayahuasca would, you know, light a candle, they're just these little teeny bright spots. And it's a whole different ballpark, which I will probably not talk to since by now, if you don't know enough about ayahuasca, I'm not going to add to it. But, as we know, because psychedelics appear in plants and animals and mushrooms, in your own body, they're synthetic, uh, they're not rare. And, and every culture we know that's had access to them has used them. We are the only culture that has created a totally new use in human history called recreational. We've been the only ones that have devalued them. So, onward. <laughs> and if you were kind of saying, and there's a lovely diagram from a lovely uh, article I don't recommend at all otherwise, which is the Psychopharmacology of LSD, a critical review, which is like all the research that has led nowhere. <laughs> but one of the questions is, what are the sciences involved with looking and studying hallucinogens? And brief list, biology, botany, music, chemistry, Anthropology, medicine, psychotherapy, psychology, sociology, religious science, theology, cultural anthropology, and art. Right? So, it doesn't fit easily in the academic framework. Academics are people, after all, who say, I want this little teeny piece of territory, and not only you're not, and you're not allowed to go outside it. And I'm going to be such an expert that I'm going to develop a jargon so you can't go outside. Because no one will know what you're talking about. And that way I'll get more space next year. Uh, this is a very different activity we're involved in. And doing it in a graduate school setting is just wonderful fun. And one of the things I'm going to suggest, and I realize I've got about eight hours of stuff, so that's why I've asked just to be cut off at some point. Um, which is... We, and, and I think this is pretty obvious from this, which is the medical model, which is most of the published research in the West, is an incredibly restrictive way to look at these things. Uh, it's not wrong, it's not evil. It's just um, kind of like saying, let's talk about all of the colors, particularly dark blue. <laughs> and yeah, we can talk about light blue, but it's, it's edgy. <laughs> And, and the problem with the medical model is it's based on uh, this very limited point of view, which is, one, you have to start out safe, and two is, 
most of it isn't getting much better, and very, re you know, so mainly it's about suppression of symptoms. And then there's also a little tiny bit called cure, but that's not as popular, and those of you who know about the kind of economics of medicine understand why. There's only one thing worse than the medical model, which is the pharmacological model, which is that we're just talking things you can put into a capsule, and if you can put it into a capsule, it somehow has been improved, because it's now standardized. Now, as I kind of look across the front row, I don't see any much standardization except maybe number of limbs. <laughs> okay, but if you all are in one of any one of the current experiments, either you're being dosed by body weight, not by brain weight, or you're all being dosed the same as if you're kind of stamp, you know, kind of like Barbie dolls. Um, it's a very poor model. And then you add to it the double blind. And the double blind means, can we find some other substance where you will actually think you got the psychedelic? And I assure you from all my research friends, the answer is no. <laughs> and then what do you have to, but you have to kind of go through the whole charade when everybody after the first hour knows, eh, it's a placebo day. <laughs> and I just heard a wonderful, wonderful story of uh, Ken Kesey, who doesn't get as much credit as Tim Leary does for bringing down the house. <laughs> but when, when Ken first was taking psychedelics, he was at the VA hospital, and it was um, blood pressure, you know, take your blood every hour, uh, bright lights, sterile room. And what Ken figured out is on placebo days, he could go home really early. So what he did is he would realize this was not a placebo day, and he'd say, hey guys, I think it's a placebo day. Remember, it's a double blind, nobody knows. <laughs> and then he would get out and woo. <laughs> <go back out. laughs> and then he worked at the VA at night, and one day he was kind of cleaning offices, and he opened the drawer, and there was the bottle, and here you all are. <laughs> so uh, Pandora's box had nothing on that bottle. <laughs> So, so the problem, it, it, is, it is a problem to keep in mind when you're particularly looking at any of the published research to understand the restrictions built into that kind of research. And when I was listening just to Larry's research, which is, oh, here's a thousand, you know, sessions, um, do something. You know, it's a very different model. Now, the sessions kind of have a slight, you know, kind of medical bias. We're kind of standardizing the dose. We're standardizing the way we're doing it. But he's doing that because that's a pretty good way of working. It's not because that's a good scientific way. I mean, um, like someone mentioned, the horror of having the same music for everybody's session. That's kind of as if you went to a psychotherapist and he had a script. It wasn't about you. Um, I don't know if any of you ever worked with any of the artificial intelligence programs of therapists. Da -da 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 -da. When did that first occur? <laughs> da -da -da -da. Would you like to say more about that? <laughs> um, after a while, you suddenly get, wait a moment. <laughs> it's like I've learned when you are in a system like your telephone company and you want to talk to a human being, the way you cut through is they say, um, and what is your address? You say, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and they say, um, I didn't understand that. Can you repeat that? Again? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> say, Just one moment, we'll connect you to an operator. <laughs> and you cut through eight levels. <laughs> so understanding the nature of the assumptions of the science or of the religion or whatever it is allows you to work much more easily and much more quickly. And then the question would be, you know, what can we begin to do once we begin to break out of that. And, as someone else pointed out, how do you get, I think a wonderful word, bracketing, which is getting your own bias out of the way. And one of the things I've been looking at, for example, is, um, and I use a word which I recommend you use, cannabis. There's another word which is a derogatory term which is used by law enforcement. So I've begun to move to cannabis, which allows you into the cannabinoid system, and you know, you're into a whole other world. Um, it was actually very hard for me to get over that marijuana wasn't something that you took to get stoned. 
So suddenly, it's, it's a cornucopia of hard medicine. You know, it's used for cancer and MS, and uh, there's a wonderful uh, video out on, have you seen the one on epilepsy? Oh, yeah. There's this lovely young woman who talks about getting off the lamp and all the other drugs that make you a soggy, boring, flat, depressed, not having seizures person. <laughs> and this lovely, vibrant, pretty woman tells you about squeezing the juice out of the leaves of the marijuana plant. Now, for those of you who don't know about the cannabis plant, the leaves are a throwaway. Except it turns out that the juice from the leaves make your epilepsy. That's the kind of breaking set that's fun. Okay, and so it, it, I'm beginning to feel that there's going to be the miracle substances, you know, of this century. Last century, what was it? Aspirin. Right, and antibiotics. It's going to be the things we're interested in. Because the amount of uses and the possibilities are just beginning to be explored. And probably an awful lot of them are known in the indigenous world, but a number aren't. And, you know, just because you've used something successfully for thousands of years doesn't mean you've exhausted its possibilities. It means you've exhausted those possibilities that made most sense within your culture. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And I think in this crowd particularly, nobody's going to fight me and say, no, no, we need a medical model, it's really cool. I think you're not going to do that. <laughs> but I thought, well, I'll throw in another model so I can at least have somebody to say, well, I don't know, I just read. <laughs> Which is the altered states of consciousness model. You, any of you ever started a presentation or read an article that says, there are many ways to achieve an altered state of consciousness? <laughs> Usually, I'm fine. <laughs> It's different from normal waking consciousness, uh, and you can achieve it through meditation, and through trance, and through chanting, and through ecstatic dance. Remember that? Most of the time when you're really looking at what psychedelics or theogens are doing for people, it really, they really don't fit that model all that well. Uh, you know, the meditation people say, hey, you can either take a no, take LSD once, or you could meditate for 20 years. It's just the same thing. <laughs> what they're saying is it's possible to get to some of these places from a very different route, and there are some overlaps. And it's, but if you actually look at the long-term meditation research, you've got massive changes in brain structure after 20 years. So that's different from the same state achieved with no changes in brain structure, for example. So, because I now get, I, I used to get letters that said, you're a hateful, rotten person for being interested in psychedelics, people should do, and then they'd fill in their spiritual discipline. <laughs> because it's the best and everything else is crap. <laughs> and I would write back, I'd never thought of that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> but we're, we're now at one generation down. Now I get the letter that says using psychedelics isn't really as good as my system, and I should know because I started with psychedelics. And then they usually say it's a great starter. And then I get Jack Cornfield, who says 80% of the Buddhist teachers in the United States started with psychedelics. But if you kind of read the Buddhist literature, oh, you shouldn't use psychedelics. But if you read the esoteric Buddhist literature, it turns out you shouldn't read, use psychedelics if you're a beginner. As you get to be more advanced Buddhist, there are certain substances you use kind of at a, one level of advancement. There's a whole other set of substances you can use at a higher level of advancement in theoguides.net <laughs> for those of you who just decided he's wrong about that <laughs> <laughs> and there's a great great full of all the references you could possibly ask for um, and I also have a, a scholar who I'm just begging to get on that in Theoguides site with the same thing throughout the Muslim history because again uh, those of you who are Muslims know that you're prohibited from all kinds of stuff um, but it turns out there's the only reason there is ever a prohibition put into any system is because people are doing it. <laughs> right? No one prohibits vomiting. <laughs> 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 
because it obviously they get it's a natural function and any any uh, spiritual system that prohibits spiritual practices they must have had some of their adherents doing it and liking it. So again we need to watch out for the spiritual model as well because once you leave the medical model the world starts to get interesting. So um, let me let me just give you a sampler of some of the things that I'm working on or that people I know are working on because I've become um, a collector of that that second or third level of what the uh, indigenous healers do which is tell stories so I'm collecting good stories <coughs> and I'm collecting good stories for two reasons one is it's a lot cheaper than running studies and also um, the US government is never going to allow me to run studies anyway and I've got 23 million people who've taken LSD alone and they have learned certain things and some of them when they share them allow us to move forward because um, the, one of the nice things about science is if there's one case of something it occurred okay now when you go to a peer-reviewed journal they say one doesn't count that's an anecdote and you say, okay. <laughs> and then you say, how about Jesus? <laughs> and they say, doesn't, he wouldn't get in our journal either. <laughs> so, obviously, one case, you know, I mean, how many Picassos do you need before you get that he actually did that stuff? <laughs> okay, so again, that's a part of the scientific model that says you need, a, you need enough of a sample so that the individuality can be washed out. But that's, you know... Dating sites don't work that way. Right? You change models, you get a lot of different results. So let me give you just just some things from the field. And since you're, a number of you are not yet finished being driven by school, and have you not moved from school into what we call debt, <laughs> which used to be called graduation. <laughs> I've been, I've been looking at what I'm calling, what's now being called, a microdosing. Microdosing is taking a, an amount of a substance, let me use LSD because I know it the best, that is below the perceptual <coughs> threshold, it's called the sub-perceptual dose. With LSD, it's 10 micrograms. They're sometimes also called tenors. And it turns out that what Albert Hoffman said is, publicly, is this is the most under-researched area. What Albert Hoffman said privately is, how do you think I got to be 101 <laughs> and look so good? <laughs> so a number of people have told, his biographer, by the way, says this isn't so, but the people who told me what he told them indicated that he experimented extensively with microdosing. So it comes, from, you know, I think that's a good role model for me. At 101, you give two or three hour lectures that people want to come to, <laughs> okay? So, what I'm finding, because what I ask people who are interested in microdosing to just do it, not every day, so they can distinguish, and to tell me stories. And the overall stories are that they appear to be, for most people, um, and what I, what I, what someone called an all chakra enhancer. Now, I will not ask how many of you are on Adderall, because I don't want to know. <laughs> uh, or wish you were, don't want to know. <laughs> but it's, it's as if you had something that had the benefits of something like, a, like, a, like speed, because it's all Adderall is. But it was without any of the side effects or any even of the major physical effects. But you were a little nicer during the day, you were a little kinder, you ate a little better, you did one more set of reps at the gym, it's not big stuff. Um, instead of being able to work on your dissertation proposal for two hours, you did three and a half. And at the end of the day you said, this was a really good day. That's the reports I'm getting. I'm, people who are singers say, you know, I just sung a little, I could hear the difference. Um, wonderful musician who, who used, used microdoses of psilocybin because he also picked it himself. 
Um, he said, you know, I'm not that, I'm not really that good a guitar player, but what I noticed on days when I had a microdose, I remembered a lot more songs as he jammed with people. Um, that's the kind of thing I'm discovering. Okay? So if you want to be part of the research, jfadiman at gmail, and just send me your story. And I assure you, those of you who are really concerned with your careers, I won't give you credit. <laughs> because we're not yet at, the, at one of the places that I want to look at, and you might consider that it may be time for us to learn, particularly living in San Francisco from the gay community, it may be time to start coming up. Okay? The reason is that there's 23 million people that have taken LSD, there's another 14 million with ecstasy, if you throw in cannabis, we're 140 million. I mean, who's kidding ourselves? <laughs> Probably the only major group that has not had considerable psychedelic experience are in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why the laws have lagged behind the culture. Mm -hmm. So, um, academic story, um, undergraduate, economics course. He's a fair student, you know, B's and C's. Uh, economic midterm is coming up. He has not studied much, an hour. And he is not a, uh, a psychonaut. But for reasons unbeknown, you know, unknown to the people who, who shared this with me, and this is a very fresh story, because he's writing me actually this weekend, the details. Um, he had about um, 1.75 grams um, of psilocybin, which is uh, not a microdose. Um, and there's the few nods here suggest, okay, that. <laughs> and he took the exam. Okay? Now, how'd he do? Well, he did better than 100, there were 300 students in the class. He did better than 100 students. He did better than 200 students. He did better than 299 students. For those of you who are still taking exams, think about it. <laughs> this is not a recommendation, it's a story. It's an end of one. Okay? And I assure you, see, it won't work if all, if all 300 students took it. <laughs> 300 A's, oh, what could we do? <laughs> Um, someone who later went on to become one of the uh, rather serious psychedelic researchers and human potential movement and so forth, he had taken in college a, a kind of developmental uh, biological physiology course. It's how do organisms move from single cells to, you know, to like being a chicken. And he, uh, for reasons like having a bad cold, he missed the final exam. So he called the professor and he said, you know, I missed your final exam, I was ill. She said, that's fine, uh, makeup exam, um, can you uh, be over at my office in two hours? And he um, licked the last of his acid, <laughs> the last of his tab, which had been stored in the refrigerator and had been licked during the semester, and it was kind of double lick, <laughs> uh, but, but really not much. And he went over, and the professor said, okay, um, here's some blank pieces of paper. Um, draw and label every stage of development of, in this case it was a chicken, from, and he said, that's the whole course. <laughs> she said, well, makeup exams are supposed to be harder. <laughs> and he went into first despair, and since that didn't work, he then just closed his eyes, and a picture came up, which was the first drawing. And he, he, he then kind of moved in his mind, kind of PowerPointed, and he realized that he could see each of her, you know, major classroom, this was pre-PowerPoint drawings, were slides. And so he just, and for about two hours, just made drawings. And she looked them over and said, you did very well. <laughs> he said, thank you very much. And then as he looked up, this was outside her office, which had things growing around. He said, 
the flowers were simply splendid. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one's only maybe true, but it's so wonderful. Remember the SAT? This was someone who um, had forgotten what day it was and came in totally blasted. And the questions, you know. <laughs> so that wasn't going to work. But when he looked at the answer sheet and he just said, I really need to pass this exam. And then one, and the first line had, you know, three or four A, B, C, D, E. And one of them just seemed to have a little brighter, so he checked that. And he went down, and he, all he did was do the answer sheet. <laughs> he didn't look at any of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Over 750. Now, 800's the top. I love it. <laughs> and what it reminded me of is some other um, stories from personal, personal memoirs. And um, one of the problems with peyote, if you've ever searched for it, it's hard to find. Peyote, you know, stands about a quarter of an inch above ground, and it looks an awful lot like ground. Um, it's very quiet. And the way traditionally, the way you pick peyote is you eat peyote, and then you say to peyote, can I eat some of your brothers and sisters? Mm -hmm. And peyote basically says, let me check you out. Okay. Well, one of those stories is wonderful because after checked him out, the, he couldn't find anything. But then what he noticed is, this was now getting to be dusk, is little like um, searchlights, you know when you see movies coming to town, great big searchlights? Little teeny blue searchlights <laughs> um, were popping up around him. And so at the bottom of each searchlight was a peyote button. <laughs> Now that, that to me makes total sense because um, peyote knows we're all one and we're certainly we all peyotes are one and so forth. And, but the, the one that I like even better is the guy who was with a whole, you know, he finally made it being a gringo into the inner circle. He was taken out and everyone understood that you find your own peyote or else you're not going to do this basic ceremony which is at the end of like eight years of apprenticeship. And he looks for hours, and nothing. And he has to get that he's not going to do it. And then he basically get. He basically says, "I surrender. I I can't do this without help." And then he looks around, and there's a peyote, <laughs> and there's a peyote, and there's a peyote. And he then accumulates a bunch of peyote and, and so forth and so on. Um, this doesn't work well within the medical model. <laughs> okay. Um, I do have a friend who, at the moment, um, has been reading medieval Hebrew texts. Now, what he finds is, and and this was referred to briefly here. I think Susan mentioned it. Um, he takes a little bit of ayahuasca every day. Because he finds on the days where he takes ayahuasca just a little bit, it's much easier to read the medieval Hebrew. Right? I said to him, why are you using ayahuasca? He says, because I have ayahuasca. <laughs> okay? <laughs> then there's a famous one. If we then change, let's look just at, these are kind of intellectual skills. Physical skills are a little trickier. Because I don't know if some of you have noticed that, as someone said here, there's a point in, a, in, a, in, in working with various substances, again, I know LSD better, um, mainly you think lying down is the only thing to do. <laughs> okay, and um, there was a pitcher, this is a famous case, a um, very fine pitcher who um, was on July 12, 1970, he was with his girlfriend in LA and they had both decided to take LSD for the day and then as she as he started to come on, she read in the paper and says, Hey, you're pitching today in San Diego. Oh. <laughs> so somehow he got to the airport and as he said by the it kind of came on by the time it was at a peak, he was at the ballpark. 
I was in Los Angeles and the team was playing in San Diego, but I didn't know it. I'd taken LSD. I thought it was an off day, and that's how I came to have it in me. I took the LSD at noon. At 1 p.m., my girlfriend says, Hey, Doc, you're pitching today. That's when it was $9.50 to fly to San Diego. I got there at 4.30 and the game started at 6.05. I can only remember bits and pieces of the game. <laughs> I was psyched. I had a feeling of euphoria. I was zeroed in on the catcher's glove, but I didn't hit the glove too much. I remember hitting a couple of batters. <laughs> the bases were loaded two or three times. The ball was small sometimes, the ball was large sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I saw the catcher and sometimes I didn't. <laughs> Sometimes I tried to stare the hitter down and throw while I was looking at him. I chewed my gum until it turned into powder. They say I had three or four fielding's chances. I remember diving out of the way of the ball I thought was a line drive. I jumped, but the ball wasn't hit hard and never reached me. The Pirates won the game 2-0. And although Doc Ellis walked eight batters, it was the high point of the baseball career of one of the finest pitchers of his time, and arguably one of the greatest achievements in the history of sports. <laughs> A no hitter. We need to research that. I mean, steroids? Come on. There's some things that we just don't know much about. Okay? Then, um, one of the things uh, that my story brings in, bring in, is uh, medical, medical questions that don't fit the kind of psychedelic model. Um, I'm now, uh, Andy Wilde has something in one of his books about getting over an allergy to cats. Cat couldn't enter the room before Andy would be sneezing. Except during an LSD session, a cat, who, you know, you know what cats do during psychedelics. So this one jumped into his lap. He's never had an allergic reaction again. That's published. Okay, so I talk about it, and um, the, and I've now got two more cases. One where the guy took a low dose of LSD, having read in Andy's book, went out and grabbed the grasses that blew him away and said, I'm not allergic to you anymore. <laughs> Done. And the one I just got is someone who is, um, he's going on a camping trip. Um, she was reading sections of your book to me. She read the portion about getting over an allergy through LSD or psychedelic mushrooms. I was immediately skeptical. And given that I don't have much time, you know the rest of the story. He's, for the first time since he's been 10 years old, he has no allergies. This is a kid who lived with medications in one hand. He said, I carried so much Kleenex when I first met my girlfriend's parents. They thought I had a physical abnormality because of the bulge of Kleenex. Okay? So, um, Ibogaine and Ayahuasca, we know about long-term addiction. We don't know, by the way, why it necessarily works, but we know it works. Um, what we do know is one session of LSD um, has about a 50% cure rate for basically incurable alcoholism. Not bad. Um, and what, what it is is people's, you know, what we have is a not a medical and not a physiological, and in many cases not a spiritual. But we do have learning. And that's a different model which is how can someone who's been long-term chronic alcoholic with liver disease stop drinking? Not because their physiology has changed, but because their entire worldview has changed and they've learned something. And we talked about insights here. Okay, I got, I got a couple hours more with this stuff. You actually have an extra 15 minutes. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, let me just then give you just a little, a different, a little different data, which is just what the psychotherapeutic advantages are. And this is someone who'd taken LSD pretty much weekly and had a good time. Um, this guy, in, I think he's in Virginia, and he's um, just joining a major union, like electrical. Um, it's again, because I wrote the book. 
Um, I read aloud some parts, and she agreed this is what I was looking for. I had a person guide me for the first time. And wow, what a difference it made in my life. I was able to recognize some of my behaviors I wanted to change, but I was unable to. My fear of abandonment has nearly left me. I forgive my mother for the abuse. I'm more loving towards my wife. Instead of watching TV or playing video games, I take my daughter on nature walks and feel more active, so forth. And I don't want to do acid every week anymore. I want to start integrating it, and it's going to be a lot of months before I think of it again. Uh, I happen to be a right-wing nut about the value of guides, yeah. okay, which is why I love the ayahuasca. Because nobody says, hey, let's drop A. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll get the puke bucket. <laughs> <laughs> ayahuasca is like right. self-protective. You just, you know, you really don't, you, know, you really use guides. Okay, so, um, just the other thing is I just want to give you a little breakdown. There was a kind of question, is what's going on today? Um, I used to complain that just because we stopped all research, we could have asked the 23 million people what's up. So I started asking. So I was in Santa Cruz a couple of weeks ago, and 300 students who came to a talk about LSD research. Um, out of the 184 uh, so far that I've, I've read their little, I gave them a one-page question, uh, only 83% had used LSD. 19% um, peyote and mescaline, 71% MDMA, uh, DMT 28%, salvia 57, psilocybin and mushrooms 86, that was more than LSD, and ayahuasca 8%. And then 2CE, and then we got into all the, you know, the alphabetamines. And, it, it, <laughs> and I, I no longer can talk to a bunch of students and say, I'm going to teach you guys about drug taking. Because people, this is average age 21. Average number of drugs per student, about four and a half. Okay, and I thought, how can I? <laughs> I don't want to let them know how much, that many of them have had more drugs than I have, and I've had lots more time to fill in. <laughs> but what, and then have you ever smoked marijuana? They put that on the back page. I think one person said no. Um, so there are businesses, if you want to work the college circuit, that are quite amazing. And would I take psychedelics again? About 90%. And the one that I wanted to, to leave you with is, have you ever been harmed or damaged? 65% said no. 5% said yes, I've been damaged. 31% said, I had some problems. And I, I urge you, when we're talking about, there's a lot of talk about language here, it was very wise. Um, I recommend that we drop the term bad trip mm -hmm. and replace it with the term challenging trip. Mm -hmm. Because that's more accurate except for a few percent. And my guess is, if you've had a seriously bad trip which had no redeeming qualities, then you don't come to these conferences anymore. <laughs> right? So what we're looking at is a whole way of looking at material that we haven't done. That we kind of got into the good, bad, bad trip, you know, duality, whatever, so forth. Um, and we don't need to do that. So I recommend, since you guys are going to, you know, take over soon, the sooner the better, please. <laughs> um, particularly the women, please get rid of us <laughs> while the planet is still left. Uh, we could live without the bad trip uh, notion, and the challenging trip becomes then much more valuable and important and useful, and we all know much more about it. Okay, that's enough. Um, suggestions of where we might begin to go. Um, I think what we also have to get rid of, and you probably don't know where it happened, but we still are, science is still dragging its ass up what's called the great chain of being. Great chain of being says, God is the highest being in the universe, the Pope is second, <laughs> and the King is probably pretty close, and that's the way it should be. So the Pope then controls everything below, just as God controls everything. And then below the king are the, the barons and the, the oligarchs and, and so forth. Um, by the way, when you get into this and where it came from, there's men and then there's women. And they're on, on that hierarchy. 
And then below humans are animals, and below animals are plants, and below plants are um, insects and bacteria and so forth. Um, that's the way a lot of people really think the world is, particularly that humans are higher. Mm -hmm. w those of you who've, who've had plants kind of tell you what a jerk you are. <laughs> you're a plant. Yeah, but I'm a lot smarter than you are. And I'm telepathic and you're not. <laughs> and I know what's wrong with you and you don't know what's wrong with me, so let's not discuss it very hard. <laughs> so what we need to begin to do is get rid of that. It happens to be about the 12th century, St. Thomas Aquinas, and we don't need it. We really can start to let go of it because intelligence turns out to be a totally different concept. My favorite is something, my favorite intelligent being is called a slime mold. It's a one-celled animal, like no organs, no nervous system, no spine, no nothing. And it, when it glumps together, it becomes a big one-celled organism, and it rolls and it turns out that if you make a, a maze, not really too hard a maze, but a maze, and you put its favorite food, which is oatmeal, I don't know why. <laughs> Evolution rated for oatmeal. <laughs> the slime mold will figure out the, the most economical path through the maze. Okay? So you and slime mold share a common attribute, intelligence. And when we start looking at the world that way, and then we talk about plant intelligence, we can begin to have a realistic discussion. Again, it's letting go of a whole other part of the, quote, scientific model. But it really, remember, the real science model is everything counts, anything that can be observed, any way, shape, or form, is what you should be looking at. And for the people who like counting, they can sit on that side of the room and count stuff. And the rest of us can just continue to discover. So that's a, a kind of general point of view. And what it brings up, and there was a question earlier about um, basically the DMT elves, are they real or not? And the answer is yes and no. <laughs> Which is, in our, you know, when you're working with your whole mind, that's a totally appropriate answer. And we need to remember that coming up with an answer that's okay to people who like to count is just pandering. <coughs> Now what we need to do is come up with something that makes sense to us, that makes our lives work better, that allows us to, to get back to being part of the natural world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the nice things that we all know. Okay, enough. Invited to things rather than what used to happen, which is to be disinvited. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to open it for a question. Question in the back. I was wondering what you think. Now, uh, louder, please. I was wondering what you think we owe to psychedelics, uh, considering their use in in their uh, the way they inspired a lot of the Silicon Valley in innovation. Oh, I didn't even I didn't even get to that part. Right. Yeah, but if you if you want to know what's the percentage of firms in Silicon Valley who have tried, not microdosing, that's another way, which is scientific problem solving on doses of about 100 micrograms, a lot. Okay, we'll leave it at Apple, and it's a lot. And I can think of a dozen other companies, but most of them haven't yet been outed. It's part of my reason for wanting to out everyone. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask why you didn't touch on the microdosing of Doug Engelbart and early computer innovators as uh, written about in... Well, because I happen to have given Doug Engelbart that dose, and it wasn't a microdose. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, he didn't invent the mouse and word processing after working with us. I was very sorry about that. <laughs> he did it before. And also, why do you think research hasn't moved to places where they've decriminalized psychedelics like Portugal and Czech Republic? <laughs> I mean, why, why is a country that votes consistently against its own people and has its own people vote against their self-interest? Mm -hmm. and, and a country that learns zero from liquor prohibition? Are you asking that question? <laughs> I think he's asking why, why aren't they doing more research in places where it's legal in public? Exactly. Yeah. Well, one of the things is there's a huge amount of research being done. Um, I mean, how many of you are doing personal exploration? Okay. Right? What are you going to do with it 
right? That's kind of question. Are you going to form, you know, another Silicon Valley? Are you going to, um, you know, create wonderful art? And so forth and so on and so on. Uh, kind of my, my current favorite, because I keep, there's two Nobel Prize winners so far that have outed themselves. Um, my current favorite is, is uh, John Robbins, member of Baskin and Robbins, who became the health food guru of the planet. He, he actually was a therapist for a while, and he really preferred MDMA for his clients. But his LSD experiences just made his worldview intelligent to him, meaning he's part of nature. So, I don't know how many of you are more vegetarians than you were five years ago. Hands, please. Okay. Um, maybe some of your inner experiences led you to that. Or you read, you know, a million other things that it's bad for you to, to eat dead animals that look at you and so forth. So, another question, please. Yes, please. There's a story about Crick uh, visualizing the DNA helix. <laughs> True. All, all we know is that the uh, reporter who did the story, including Crick saying, I'll kill you if you publish this before I'm dead, <laughs> says it's true. Yeah. And what I love is we know that they had gotten to the single helix. We know that LSD was used by a whole bunch of folks in that crowd. And having also worked with scientists on creative problem solving, and it's a totally visual solution, it, you know, let's put it this way, I think it's true, and I quote it. I have had people write me and say, it isn't true, and I think, okay, for them it isn't true. My life works better with it being true. So, I don't know. Uh, do you think our brains create consciousness, or do they perceive consciousness from some outside source? Undoubtedly. The latter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, once you get that you're smarter, maybe, than a, uh, you know, than, than the slime mold, then it's a matter of degree. And I would say, did the slime mold really solve the maze, or did it have an ally? Right? Do slime molds... See, that's a, that's a fun question. Do slime molds have allies from the higher, you know, from the upper world? And if you've ever seen slime molds, the argument that they have allies is it's pretty reasonable. <laughs> okay, and then you look at the way we behave, and thank God we have allies. <laughs> Without it, we're in such serious trouble. So, I love that notion, are we big radio receivers and is yeah. consciousness coming up like on 500 channels, or are we generating consciousness? Probably some of both. My, I, I'm from William James, uh, as a philosopher, it says, if the distinction between points of view doesn't go anywhere, then do something else with your time. And for me, that doesn't go anywhere. I like it, I can do that stuff, but not when I'm under time pressure. I can also talk about different kinds of Buddhism, but who cares? <laughs> yeah. uh, how many times would you guess that you've taken psychedelics in your life? What do we? <laughs> who is the me we're talking about? Remember, <laughs> remember I just said Buddhism? I got no, there's no self. <laughs> See, I mean, in a sense, I think that's a very interesting question, but the question that I come back to is, why would that matter to you? It might matter to me. I, I don't know why, because I'm not a self either. It just came out of my mouth. Okay, well, um, more, uh, not enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my other <laughs> Actually, that, I'm going to keep that in. <laughs> See, one of the problems is, now that I know how much more drugs people who are 20 years old have had than I have, <laughs> It's awkward to answer those kind of questions. It's bad enough to say, I really don't know what 2CI does. Because <laughs> then the, all the people who are into the exotic stuff know that I'm worthless. <laughs> and I'm worthless on my own. <laughs> so I don't want to leave a telltale. Let's say that I had a session once that totally transformed my life. And I had more than that. 
but the transformation of my life was probably more important than most of the other sessions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's probably a, a kind of a little more less smart ass answer. <laughs> when you have no self and you're still a smart ass, <laughs> <laughs> something's wrong with Buddhism. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, I have a so you use the term drugs. I do. Um, drugs. Is there an intentionality behind that? No, it's stupid. Because there's this stigma attached to it, which no, seems to hinder the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You do you have, you have preferred I prefer, language? I actually like the word psychedelic. Okay. Um, but 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 I'm trying to hesitate because every time I say psych, I think in theogenic visioning be cool, <laughs> and I really think psychedelics used as entheogens is where my real interest is. Okay. I mean, I kind of dig the cat allergy stuff and the economics, but my mm -hmm. real interest is have the experience that totally transforms your reality and work out your destiny. That's kind of where I'm really coming from, but I don't do that. Because then all the people that say, hey, man, I just like to drop and dig the, the you know, and I'm yeah. nice to people, and what's the point of going to Burning Man if you're not going to, like, try and get laid ten times and take ten different <laughs> drugs? You know, I don't want to yeah. lose those people. Yeah, I think it requires a more elegant rebranding. Uh, right. Because it's, it's, like, it's like a mouth soup, try to say, you know, like, transformative antigenic experience. And, and then like drugs, drugs has the stigma attached to it. Substances, so. by the way, in your emails, don't mention the name of any substance. <laughs> All American emails are collected by the federal government and the data mining is based on things like proper nouns. So if you're going to talk to someone, talk about a substance, I don't even use drug because that brings out all the dark drug people. I don't say medicine for various reasons. Um, I understand sacred medicine because that's its fundamental use and most, and as we were told, um, there's a wonderful thing Maria Sabina says. Maria Sabina is the woman who turned Gordon Lawson on and yes, there was someone from the CIA way with him and he might have been a dark force, blah, blah, blah. Um, like Crick. Okay, who knows? She said, you know, until the gringos started coming, nobody ever said to me, I want to take the little people to, to, uh, to see God. Everybody came for healing or divination. So, so you know, that's what I say that even, you know, even the, the wonderful indigenous people who know a zillion things more than I do um, may, have, may not know about you know, how to pass the SATs and so forth. So I, I, I apologize for the use of the word drug, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mentioned this idea of outing people. Yes. Uh, can you... Oh, that's just getting people. View about this? Yeah, like, my political view is that if 23 million Americans stood up and said, you know, I've used LSD and it's not so bad, it would be harder to enforce a lot of laws, particularly since that particular subgroup would tend to be more educated, more likely to be judges, policemen, prosecutors, DAs, everything, as I say, but legislators. Um, and it's similar. I've been really looking at the gay movement. And at some point, people said, you know, we got to come out. Uh, there used to be something in the gay world, there was a law, there was a, a game called entrapment, you know, where the policeman would come up and say, hi, you're as good looking as I think you are. And you'd say, yeah, you're under arrest. <laughs> okay? We have it now. It's called entrapment. You go to a concert. And somebody that looks just like you says, hey man, you got anything? And you say, yeah, I got two tabs of MDMA. And the guy says, can I buy one from you? And you say, no, man, this is, you know, this is righteous. I'll give you one. He says, no, man, I can't take it from you. I'll pay you for it. No, man, I can't possibly be paid for it. Look, I'm going to throw a $10 bill on the ground. You want to leave it there? It's fine with me. He says, okay. And by the way, you're under arrest because you just sold it. It's called entrapment. I think if 23 million people stood up and said, I don't think that's a good idea, that would help. That's all. It's an idea. 
I, I, I want to say that I, I was in this conference about here in San Francisco, my touristic explorations, BDSM conference. Mm -hmm. So in the basement of the Holiday Inn, they were doing all kinds of consensual right. sex acts between right. adults. Right. And I was just so amazed if you compare like sex rights movements to drug rights movements, mm -hmm. how beyond drug rights movements is, like you could never have people engaging in using substances, even if they are adult and consensual and, you know, well, over their bodies. If you compare the movements, I think it's much more taboo still over drugs. Um, right. Never been to a, well, you probably haven't because you are a, a veritable child, but a Grateful Dead concert? <laughs> okay, believe me, the reason that there's a medical unit of volunteers at the back of the Dead concert and the back of most concerts, uh, dance safe, Sanctuary. How many of you have been to Burning Man? Okay, I hope none of you know what sanctuary is. <laughs> sanctuary is when you have taken something, there's only 50,000 people there, and you've taken something and you've screwed up, or you've been date raped, or you've forgot your water, whatever it is, you end up in sanctuary. Where very, very highly trained people are there to keep you out of the legal system. So we do have ways of noticing that people are doing... Um, a lot of things in the cellar, um, in places you wouldn't imagine. Um, I was asking about some very esoteric uh, substance, and my informant uh, was a professional guide for guided sessions. He'd had four years' experience. He was 21. <laughs> and he's in northern Virginia. And I said, how come you know about that? He said, you'd be amazed <laughs> what's available. And what I've found is... Almost every psychedelic you've ever heard of, and some you haven't, are available in almost every high school, every college, and to my amazement, every prison. <laughs> so, you know, because I now get letters and say, just terrible, tragic stories would make us all cry, and, you know, is there someone I know, you know, you know who could help me get some substance? <laughs> And I write back, do you know any kids? Because <laughs> <laughs> I say, I'm legal, I'm visible, I don't do anything illegal. I, and I don't, since I've become a public figure. Because I need to be able to say, I don't do anything. Um, and that's kind of where it is. So the world, you know, the culture is changing, and because we can't quite talk about it yet, it's changing not quite as fast as it could. And so one of the things, when I... You know, when you write a book, you become a whore. Hi, I don't know you, but wouldn't, you know, I wrote this book. <laughs> Hi, I'm sitting next to you on the plane, and you look like a, either a, you know, Bank of America senior executive or a CIA plant in, you know, Ethiopia. Hi, I've written this book about drugs. And what I've found is, again and again, again, these guys who, you know, look like they would, after they get you to death, they jail you. There's this moment of, you know, a scummy old hippie. And then there's this little moment, this softness happens. And they say, you know, when I was a sophomore, I remember, yeah. At the end of the night, I was running through the streets of Charlotte, naked. <laughs> and I was yelling, what are you all doing hiding in your clothes? <laughs> And then the softness would go away, and there was, but it was an interesting moment. So that's what I'm finding. It's hard for me to find a bunch of professionals who, when I don't do my little whore number, a lot of them come out. And when you're a therapist, and if you want to be therapists, you really got to let your clients know that you know stuff, or they won't tell you. Lots of clients have talked to me about their therapists. And they, they bring up something indirect, and their therapist, you know, says, oh, you know, it's bad for you. Or it'll make you bald or insane, depending on the drug. And they say, okay, I can't tell them this incredibly important part of my life, because they're, they're maybe great <coughs> therapists, but they happen to have no experience. And therefore, I can't be helped by them. So there's reasons I suggest coming out. So one more question, probably we're out of time. We okay? Three more minutes. Okay. Oh, one more question.
One more question, and it has to be well, two if we do quickies. <laughs> I got a quickie. Is that a different kind of entrapment that you just described? <laughs> <laughs> just leave me your name and thumbprint at the door. <laughs> <laughs> what a method we've got to get all of you guys. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have examples of public figures who you have seen done the coming out process well and with sophistication that are examples for other people? Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> Um, that's a good list. I'm going to have to start making that list. Okay. Um, I did get a letter from a guy who runs a $200 million a year company, and he said he just wanted to visit. And I thought, I know I want to go. I have Rosebush. <laughs> so he brought with him the head of his uh, pharmacology department, which was a whole company of itself, and the guy's wife, who was a teacher of psychopharmacology, and the three of us talked for a while, not him, um, because they were younger and talked about their drug experiences. Why do you go into psychopharmacology? I mean, my God, because you're really interested in indole rings? <laughs> um, and then he talked about his own. So, um, oddly enough, you really don't get much in trouble for something you say you did a long time ago. Now, some of you aren't old enough to have much of a long time ago, <laughs> so you might want to wait. <laughs> so, one more real quickie, like... Um, well, that's not quick. Anymore. Well, my answer would be quick. <laughs> how, how young is... What's the real force behind making the... What's the real reason for prohibition for psychedelics? Yeah, that's good. Economics, religion... Because God uh, hates homosexuals. <laughs> <laughs> Katrina, tornadoes in Oklahoma, where all the gays are. You know, I mean, San Francisco is the most desirable city on the planet for Europeans. Um, Uranus is hiding behind Pluto, who's pissed off because it's no longer a planet. I mean, there's a lot of good reasons. <laughs> the reason is because the, in the 60s, the people who were taking psychedelics looked at the establishment and said, I think we could live without the banks, the industries, the education, and the military. And all those people said, I have all the power, and I don't want to be made irrelevant. Let's vote, and I have 99% of the votes. We now have a different system. Who is the 99%? That's enough. Yeah. Thank you.